Welcome to the uh, keynote address of the uh, fourth annual Julius Rabinovitz Center for Public Policy and Finance. Very pleased to have everyone here. We are also very fortunate to have Larry Summers with us. He will be speaking for 45 minutes or so, and then we'll have an open question and answer session with the audience. Larry does not need an introduction. One can see it with the house full here. Everyone knows him very well. I'll uh, nonetheless uh, introduce him. He is the Charles Elliott University Professor of Economics at Harvard University, where he is also the President Emeritus. Uh, he was the, the Treasury Secretary under uh, President Clinton's administration, and then the Director of the National uh, Council of Economic Policy under President Obama. So we are very pleased to have him, and uh, Larry will be speaking on uh, his reflections on the topic of secular stagnation. Thank you. Thank you for those uh, generous words. I am uh, glad to uh, be here. Glad to see uh, so many old friends. My former Treasury colleague, uh, Jeff Schaefer, from whom I learned much of what little I know about uh, international economic interactions and things relating uh, to Europe. My uh, former student, and uh, then uh, government uh, colleague, uh, Alan Kruger, whose uh, work has illuminated uh, so much to do with the working or the non-working of uh, labor markets. Um, my friend, uh, David Wessel, who covered my activities in government uh, for many, many years at uh, the Wall Street Journal, and I can now tell you that on any occasion when I looked good, it was because he was reporting accurately. <laughs> and on any occasion uh, when I looked uh, bad, it was because he did not have an accurate rendering of uh, the truth. And I just want to say before I launch into my topic um, that as someone who has spent his life in a way, shuttling back and forth uh, between government and uh, universities. I think that conferences like this one and centers like the one that is convening it are really profoundly important. And if, for example, the United States has had a more successful response to financial crisis than Europe or uh, Japan, it is importantly because of the kind of close connections between the worlds of thought and the worlds of action that the American system uh, makes uh, possible. And that I believe the cultivation and support of worldly academic research uh, in economics is something that is uh, very, very important. I also believe that economic ideas, when either right or wrong, spur change and spur progress. When right, they make an important contribution. When wrong, they provide important clarification that ultimately proves to contribute uh, to of public policy. What I'd like to do today is talk about my perspective, and I'll try to recognize that there are multiple uh, perspectives, on what seems to me to be the profound macroeconomic challenge of the next 20 years in uh, the industrial world. And that is uh, the problem of what I like to call secular stagnation, following uh, Alvin uh, Hansen. Start with, if I can get this to work. Oh, can somebody help me? This looks like a tape recorder rather than a <laughs> clicker. I just want to make it go. 
The keyboard. All right. I'm going to talk about six things. I'm going to talk about why we're talking about secular stagnation, uh, the dismal performance of the industrial world in recent years. I'm going to talk about the secular stagnation hypothesis as Hansen uh, framed it, talk about what's a central element in that, the low level of real interest rates, reflect on some of the challenges that have been posed to the hypothesis, and then discuss what is, uh, to, be, uh, what is to be done. I'm sorry. Where is it? Somebody? I'm not really usually this stupid. Oh. This shows you what's, this shows you um, U.S. economic performance uh, since 2007 <coughs> measured relative to what we aspired to in 2007. What you see is that the economy went off a small cliff between 2007 and 2009 and that relative to what we aspired to in 2007, there has been no catch up. The GDP gap is indeed smaller than it was in 2009, but that is entirely because our judgment about potential has been revised downwards in the face, uh, in the, in the face of dismal performance. If anything, the picture is worse. Um, in uh, Europe, where there has been essentially no progress and where the gap relative to potential as we had assumed it would be has steadily increased and is continuing uh, to uh, increase. And of course, this is all reminiscent of uh, the Japanese experience. And it would be a rough summary of macroeconomics in this decade to say that Japan is the old Japan and Europe is the new uh, Japan. Europe today looks very much like Japan did seven or eight years post uh, bubble. Demographically, challenged, incipiently deflating with severe financial strains, with dysfunctional politics and ineffective decision making. And I should say that this picture is profoundly, in my view, inconsistent with the dominant presentation of the crisis and way of thinking about the crisis that comes through in most of what has so far been written and said about the U.S. financial crisis. Roughly speaking, and I exaggerate uh, a little bit uh, for effect, the dominant um, descriptions of the crisis fall within the framework of what I would call the financial network failure theory. Something went wrong, bubbles, bank runs, insolvencies, whatever it was, there was this vast mass panic. It looked like the financial system was going to collapse. Heroes rode to the rescue. Liquidity was provided. Stimulus was provided. The system was uh, repaired. The system held, we didn't have the depression, and life went on. That's the, if you read David's book, that's the, uh, that, that David would not accept that as a full and rich and nuanced summary of his book, but David's book, which is the best of the books that has been written about <laughs> uh, the crisis, has, has, no, has very much that element. 
And it's pretty clear that it could have gone another way and the system could have collapsed. But that captures a very important aspect of what took place. But it's very incomplete as a capturing of what took place. Think about the economics of power failures. What would you have, what would you expect would happen if the economy had a terrible power failure and was without electricity and the electricity network didn't work? You'd expect there to be a near collapse while that was happening. And you could try to think about just how that collapse played off, but it's pretty clear that if you had a big power failure, there'd be a big collapse. But what would you expect when the power was turned back on? You'd expect that the economy would start to function well again, and indeed, you'd expect that there'd be even more production, because all the inventories that ran down during the power failure had to be run up. All the people who couldn't go to the store during the power failure would go to the store. So you would expect, actually, that if it was just some temporary network failure, that if anything, recovery would be very rapid, and if anything, output afterwards would be even more because of catch-up. And yet, if you look, if you look at credit spreads, if you look at the repayment of TARP, if you look at anything, it was five years ago, more than five years ago, that the lights had been turned back on, and we have not caught up at all relative to what we expected. And that suggests that we need to think about something other than the power failure model, and I believe something other than a traditional business cycle theory. Now, to further motivate why we need to think of something that's further outside uh, the conventional sandbox, I invite you to think about the period prior to the crisis. Think about the United States to start with between 2003 and 2007. It was characterized by what was regarded and criticized at the time as being overly expansionary monetary policy. A prescription drug benefit was entered into, the Iraq war was fought, tax cuts, the Bush tax cuts were entered into, widespread concern about excessively expansionary fiscal policy. We had the mother of all housing bubbles, with housing bubbles 50, 75 percent above fundamental values, and a vast erosion of credit standards that enabled people to take wealth out of that. Did any of that produce spectacular economic performance? No. Did any of that produce overheating with respect to inflation on a large scale? No. With the worst erosion of credit standards and the biggest bubbles since the Second World War, we got adequate, maybe even good, economic performance. What about um, you know, was the you look at uh, the pre-2007 part, and you ask yourself about the growth of debt to disposable income, and you say, did we have financial sustainability when we were having adequate economic performance? It doesn't look like we did. One can say the same thing with respect to Europe, and of course can add that it's in retrospect clear that the credit flows to the European periphery that were sustaining growth were manifestly unsustainable. So I've spoken at length about the period after the crisis, more briefly about the period before the crisis. Of course, the period before that was 
the 2001 recession, and the period before that was the internet bubble. And so if one asks the question, how long has it been since the American economy enjoyed reasonable growth from a reasonable unemployment rate in a financially sustainable way, the answer is that it has been really quite a long time, certainly more than half a generation. And that's why it seems to me that one has to contemplate macroeconomic uh, theories of a very different kind than is suggested by the conventional business cycle theory. Now, we'll come back to this uh, later, but just as one other observation for motivating the general approach that I'm taking in talking about secular stagnation. The first bit of sort of empirical inquiry, empirical inference, that one learns about in an introductory economics course, I would suggest is this. You take some good, we'll call it apples. If the price of apples is going up and the quantity of apples is going up, then probably the demand for apples went up. But if the quantity of apples is going up and the price of apples is going down, then probably the quantity of apples supplied went up. And so one learns to distinguish demand shocks from supply shocks. The rate of inflation, the rate of expected inflation in the United States has never been lower in the post-war period, or at least the post-war period since the 1950s. So as between the view that one should be looking overwhelmingly to the supply side and the view that one should be looking overwhelmingly to the demand side, the fact that we are seeing deflation break out all over the world would tend to lead one to suggest that at least a large part of the problems were on the demand side rather than on uh, the supply side. Now, unlike in the case of apples, in the case of the macro economy, it is much too facile to suggest that one can completely distinguish the demand side and the supply side. After all, a rapidly growing economy is going to be an economy where there's much more demand for investment than a slowly growing uh, economy. And so supply side growth affects demand. And as we've seen in the context of the last, uh, of, uh, the last uh, recession, a period of very short demand leads people to leave the labor force. And once out of the labor force, they're unlikely to return, leads to reductions in investment, which reduce subsequent uh, potential. But all I really want to convince you of at this point is that something profound has happened. And given its association with falling inflation and diminishing expected inflation over the long term, we should probably think of it as at least being substantially related to uh, demand factors. Just to reinforce uh, the point uh, in another way, here is the yield curve on uh, inflation-indexed securities before the crisis and uh, very recently. What you see is that it has declined uh, quite profoundly. I invite anybody to consider what has happened in the, rough, roughly speaking, year since I first started talking about 
secular stagnation. Quite a remarkable thing has actually happened. Even though the economy seems to have moved more strongly and smartly towards recovery, even though quantitative easing has ended, even though the Fed has moved towards signaling that liftoff will uh, take place, the expectation was that interest rates would rise <coughs> over the last year. What about expected interest rates five years hence? They've declined by almost 200 basis points. Probably about 20 or 25 of those basis points have been recovered in the three weeks since this data comes from. So I don't want to insist on it being 200 uh, basis points. Some of that is because despite the recovering economy, expected inflation has come down uh, substantially. More of it is because a market judgment about the real interest rate has come down substantially. Now recall, this is about what was expected, what is expected between 2020 and 2025. And people are expecting that the real interest rate will only be 0.6%. For people who are more technically oriented here, to the extent that you believe the normal term structure slopes upwards and so one should subtract a risk premium, that would reinforce uh, the point made by these calculations. That also suggests some change in expectation about how the economy is functioning. Alvin Hansen prophesied or addressed this kind of problem in the late 1930s when he spoke about secular stagnations, sick recoveries which die in their infancy, and depressions which feed on uh, themselves. Hansen was manifestly wrong in the sense that what prevailed after he wrote those words in 1939 was by no stretch secular stagnation. But it has always seemed to me, and this is a good example, that economists um, have a tendency to suppose that because the world equilibrates and is stable, that that means they must operate with models that equilibrate and are stable. That's fine if their model captures every aspect of the world, but their model should not have captured the Second World War, should not have captured the mass financial repression that took place during the Second World War, could not have reasonably been expected to capture the various features, the baby boom, the post-war housing boom, and more that drove the economy forward. And so whether the experience invalidated Hansen's model or reflected the fact that variables that were exogenous in Hansen's model <laughs> changed very substantially seems to me to be a quite open question. This is not the stuff of modern dynamic macro. But if, whether you believe anything I say from this point on, I address this to the graduate students in the room, if you believe the general thrust of what I said about the magnitude of our current problem, and the long period of problematic growth. It makes you think that dynamic stochastic general equilibrium is kind of irrelevant. It makes you think that what you have to understand is that there has been a big, bad, protracted failure, and that what you need is a theory 
of a big, bad, protracted failure. And a theory of quarterly time series analysis and the correlation between one blip and another has next to no potential to contribute to such an understanding. So I I'm, keep coming back to this because I'm frankly more convinced that the question of understanding macroeconomic performance should be framed in broadly the way I'm framing it than I am that the particulars of the explanation I'm offering are exactly right. So go back to basic uh, Keynesian economics and imagine that the point where the IS curve coincides with full employment involves a nominal interest rate that is lower than the attainable nominal interest rate. In that case, the, creation, the printing of more money will be unavailing in generating economic growth. The declines in the price level through the vaunted mechanisms of wage price flexibility will be potentially substantially counterproductive. Counterproductive because the extra real money balances they create will provide no stimulus, but the expectation of deflation will induce higher real interest rates, which will move up the IS curve in the wrong direction, and the redistributions from debtors to creditors will be adverse for spending, pushing the IS curve to uh, the left. So there is no assurance, there is no theorem in general equilibrium theory that says that in an economy where the interest rate is constrained, and I say constrained because one can imagine that the interest rate could fall a little bit below zero, as it now is in Switzerland, or one could imagine that there were other kinds of constraints, fears about financial stability, for example, that prevented the interest rate from being allowed to reach zero forever. The point is, if the interest rate is constrained, there is no assurance that the normal operation of the market will lead to the restoration of uh, full employment. One can draw the picture in a different way by envisioning that uh, investment is a function of the interest rate and savings are a function of uh, the uh, interest rate. And the point at which they balance at full employment is an unattainably negative level of the nominal interest rate. And so the adjustment has to take place through a reduction in income that inhibits savings. Now, I promise, I am acutely aware of the lack of a rigorous micro foundation for the simply relating the level of investment to the interest rate and the level of savings to the interest rate. But at the same time, I would suggest that if we're not trying to understand quarter to quarter fluctuations, but are trying to understand epochal changes, this has to be a closer to appropriate, uh, this has to be a close to appropriate approximation. And indeed, what is it that has happened over the recent period? There has been a pronounced increase in private savings, suggesting an increase in the savings propensity at the expense of a diminution in the investment. And, and there has also been a uh, increase in private savings and a decrease uh, in the level of investment. The Japanese case stands out. Japan has had essentially zero interest rates for 15 plus years, and chronically 
the level of private savings has been in excess of the level of investment. It's all very well to say Japan has an imprudent budget deficit, but one has to ask the question, if private savings were equated uh, with private, without that uh, budget deficit, what would happen to the level of demand uh, in uh, Japan? And as it's pretty clear where I'm going, uh, it should be pretty clear where I'm going with this. Secular stagnation is the phenomenon that the equilibrium level uh, that, that savings are chronically in excess of investment at reasonable interest rates. If secular stagnation was emerging, what would one expect to see? One would expect to see that the world real interest rate, or that the real interest rates in those places where secular stagnation was a pressing problem, were uh, chronically declining. And indeed, what you see here is that for some long time period, the real interest rate uh, has been uh, in uh, substantial uh, decline. Now, Barry Eichengreen and others have suggested that this may in some sense be misleading because this may be back to some kind of normal, and the right way to understand things is that real interest rates for some period around 1985 were aberrantly high. Perhaps so. Uh, I'm not old enough to remember this, and therefore I assume very few people in this room are old enough to remember this, but it was the view of John Kennedy's economic advisors that the 1950s were defined by three Eisenhower recessions associated with a chronic shortfall of demand for much of the 1950s as savings were in excess of investment. So yes, interest rates were low in the 1950s, and the 1950s had their kind of uh, secular stagnation. Much of the 1960s and 1970s were characterized by unexpected inflation that enabled real interest rates to be lower than uh, would otherwise have been possible. What's true for the world is true for uh, US, uh, US tips. In this latest episode, unfortunately, the 10-year real interest rate did not quite get to being negative, but on one day at the end of January, it was down to three basis points. Now, many of you will be thinking, well, this is all well and good, and it's sort of interesting, and it's kind of clever in its way, but isn't he, really missing the, isn't he really missing the point? Hasn't he noticed uh, the Fed is going to be raising rates sometime this year? So even if we've been in the liquidity trap, this is kind of about yesterday. It's not about uh, tomorrow. Look at this picture for a minute. Um, every seven and a half years, we have to cut rates by four points. Every four and a half years, we have to cut rates by two points. And so, yes, we may start increasing interest rates. But if you believe there has been a substantial decline in real interest rates and a substantial decline in the rate of inflation, will, will there be room the next time we have a downturn for a 4.5 percentage point decline in rates? And if the answer to that question is no, will the fact that there's a risk of the zero interest rate constraint binding in the future affect expectations about future economic activity and affect spending today? Those of you 
in graduate school or even in undergraduate school have studied the consumption function a bit and have learned about liquidity constraints, have learned that just because I'm not liquidity constrained today doesn't mean that liquidity constraints do not affect my spending decisions. The knowledge that if I spend up to the limit, I will be unable to borrow two years from now causes me to have a need to maintain a buffer. And in the same way, the observation that we're not constrained all the time does not mean that the possible presence of the zero interest rate uh, constraint will not affect behavior at uh, all uh, moments. I have seen various calculations, and it, the correct calculation depends on at just what mo one moment uh, does it. I believe it is an accurate calculation that at some point in late January, markets were saying that the probability that the Fed funds rate would be in the neighborhood of zero in 2018 was approaching one-third. And so the point I am making, I would suggest, is not an entirely hypothetical one in the United States. And of course, the case is by far weakest in uh, the United States. To remind, the 10-year interest rate in Germany is 35 basis points. And the 10-year interest rate in Japan is 25 basis points. And you can kind of work your way around thinking about, of that 35 basis points, how much is inflation and how much is real interest rate. And you can have a good debate about that. But you're not going to get to a notion of real interest rates and inflation that is going to suggest that the market is prophesying anything sound for a long time. And there is a global economy and a question as to how long the United States can carry that global economy. So what I've tried to convince you of so far is that the stagnation hypothesis is something to be, the question of stagnation and secular stagnation is the right way to think about the macroeconomic problems of the age. That the idea of the const lower constraint on interest rates is a crucial part uh, of that. And there's substantial reason to think that it's much more important now than it has been uh, in the past. What I want to do now is just review very quickly six or seven reasons for thinking that there has been the change in savings and investment propensities that make secular stagnation plausible. One, demography. This is what uh, Hansen uh, emphasized. The growth in the workforce in the industrial world is trailing off very, very uh, substantially. The easiest way to look at it is to look at uh, the change in the working age population. If you do it more subtly, you probably reinforce the conclusion because you had a big surge of women entering the labor force. And if anything, that tide is going out, suggesting a larger demographic change than you get just by looking at uh, the crude population figures. It costs much less to buy capital goods than uh, it used to. The canonical example being a computer. That means a given level of savings can buy much more capital than it used to be able uh, to buy, tending to create an imbalance of savings over uh, investment. Another way to think about it, a more sort of practical way to think about it, is to think about canonical leading companies and their cash position. It used to be that the canonical leading fast growing companies in the country needed to be going to the bond market and issuing bonds in order to expand and couldn't pay dividends because they had so many investment opportunities. Think about Apple. The 
as dynamic as any company uh, in uh, the economy. And what activists are demanding it do is pay dividends and repurchase stock. Think about Google, similarly a wash in cash. That kind of thing, or think about my favorite example of for thinking about these dynamics is think about two companies. Sony, it's a company, it's a strong company, it's got a strong tradition, it's got factories, it's got office buildings, it's got tens of thousands of people working for it. It's worth $18 billion. Now think about Snapchat. <laughs> All of it, the machines, the people, everything could fit in this room quite comfortably. It will, it's about to be valued by our nation's capital markets at $19 billion. Uh, What's that say? Suggests that when you can start a company for nothing and with nothing, that you will have the possibility of wealth creation without substantial investment, again, reinforcing an increase of savings over uh, investment. The developing world, for whatever reason, accumulating reserves on a very large uh, scale, as I suspect was discussed um, earlier uh, in the previous, pres previous uh, presentation, a set of portfolio changes that have led to very substantial increased demand for uh, safe assets, pushing down uh, yields. To touch on a theme that's important in this conference, rising inequality and a rising profit and a rising profit share, both operate to raise savings by putting more money in the hands of people who have high savings propensity relative to those who have low uh, savings propensity. Inflation tax interactions, which I won't take the time to explain, lead to downward pressure on the level of uh, nominal rates as inflation rates uh, decline. Sludged up financial intermediation also leads to lower rates on safe assets relative to borrowing costs. All of these factors operate to suggest that whatever the re equilibrium real interest rate was in the past, it is likely to be substantially lower today and suggest the relevance of the zero lower bound and the secular stagnation hypothesis as a challenge going forward for the industrial economies. Let me address what seemed to me to be the most natural, the most, the, the most natural objections to this line of, uh, to uh, this line of thought. Uh, some, of them, some of which I've already touched on, and then say a bit about if it's right, what should be done, and then throw this open uh, for uh, discussion. First question, can it really make sense for equilibrium real interest rates to be less than zero? As Paul Samuelson famously put it, uh, if the interest rates are less than zero, then you should shave off every hill. Because if you shave off a hill, then it's going to be better for the railroad for the long, for the, over the very long term, and it'll yield benefits forever, and so it'll be a positive NPV investment at a zero, uh, at a zero interest rate. My reaction to this is, I guess, uh, twofold. Uh, and, and does this mean that economies are dynamically inefficient, and what do we make of this idea that the real interest rates are low? First thing to say is that if you just calculate average real interest rates over the last century, they haven't been very high. So as an empirical proposition, um, real interest rates 
have a very low average and, in fact, average substantially below uh, GDP growth rates, real GDP growth rates, or equivalently, just to take a measurement problem out, nominal interest rates are less than nominal GDP uh, growth rates in most countries over most intervals. Second thing to say is the Samuelson syllogism depends on the perfection of property rights. It will not be worth my while to invest in shaving off a hill if I'm not sure how long I'll own that hill and whether I'll be able to capture all of that benefits uh, in, uh, indefinitely. And so in a world of taxation and in a world of uncertain pro uh, property rights, the nexus between the productivity of capital and uh, the real interest rate uh, is much less uh, clear. And the third argument would be, look, there's a market and it's out there and that market makes forecasts of real interest rates over long time periods. And I have not chosen the most dramatic examples. Uh, index bonds in Britain suggest real interest rates below zero out for 50 years. And so as an empirical proposition, we probably cannot dismiss the idea of negative uh, equilibrium real interest rates. Is the issue of secular stagnation a demand side issue or a supply side uh, issue? I have focused on uh, the demand side. I've done that in part because I'm doing what all academics do, but what policymakers must never do, which is focus on what I have to say that has some degree of novelty. And I have nothing new or original uh, to say about, uh, I may not have anything new or original to say at all, but I certainly don't have anything uh, hugely new or original uh, to say about uh, the supply side. I already explained that a dominantly supply side explanation seems hard to relate to a period of uh, declining inflation and in a period where uh, much of the industrial world is actually experiencing something quite close uh, to deflation. And I would remind those of you who are very America-focused that if one looks at what I at least would regard as a plausible price construct, U.S. inflation, excluding food, energy, and housing, housing because it's a complex and somewhat arbitrary calculation in which the price of rental housing is used to make judgments about the cost of owner-occupied housing. If we look over the last 12 months in the United States of America at inflation X, food, energy, and housing, it is to the nearest tenth of a percent, zero. And so these concerns um, suggest that something very important uh, is happening on uh, the demand side as well as on uh, the supply side. But I would be the first to agree that it is quite plausible that there have also been aspects of productivity slowdown that have contributed to reduced economic growth that through this accelerator mean less demand for investment that have contributed uh, to the stagnation phenomena that I described. Past fears of secular stagnation have indeed uh, proven uh, to be unfounded, but as I already tried to explain, um, that is largely because exogenous variables changed, and it is certainly possible that exogenous variables will change in the future. Indeed, it would be my hope that they will, and in important respects, that is the task of economic policy. Isn't the United States uh, approaching full employment? 
maybe the wage inflation data would not be overwhelmingly corroborative of that view uh, to this date. Even if it is, how long will it stay at full employment? And isn't there a substantial risk that the zero constraint will bind before monetary policy can address the next recession? To remind, and just to score a note of humility regarding economic science, if one looks at recessions since the Second World War in the United States, of which we have a substantial sample, not a single one was predicted one year in advance by the Council of Economic Advisors, the Federal Reserve Board, the Congressional Budget Office, the IMF, or the Survey of Professional Forecasters. And so serenity that somehow it's OK because we're doing OK and we're going to push interest rates up a little bit and they're going to get off the floor and therefore there's going to be a little bit of room uh, for them to move down seems to me to be not entirely justified. What's to be done? If you take this thesis at all, there are three broad approaches going forward. And I'm going to talk about them more quickly because I really, wanna, really wanted to focus, at least the students in the room, on what I thought the question was that macroeconomists should be thinking uh, about as much as on my particular uh, explanation. Structural, uh, structural reform. Structural reform that opens up private investment and raises the demand for private investment has to be a uh, good idea. Just how much scope for it will vary from uh, place uh, to uh, place, but economists are always for structural reform, and I am too. <laughs> I would highlight, though, that if you have a gap in which supply is in excess of demand and in which output is constrained by demand, measures which increase supply will A, not raise the level of output because it is constrained by demand, and B, increase the amount of deflationary pressure. And it seems to me that in much of what is said and written about structural reform, there is a unwillingness to distinguish between structural reforms that are demand promoting and structural reforms that are supply promoting. And a fair amount of what is suggested seems as likely to be supply promoting as uh, to uh, be uh, demand promoting. Structural reform has, in any event, been the dominant policy mantra in Japan for two decades and in Europe for the better part of a decade. And I think it is fair to say that the fruits have so far been limited. And I would also note that some of what is described as structural triumph has a significantly zero-sum element. Much of German, German success, in particular, is attributable to its emergence as highly competitive and a large-scale exporter. And the one thing that economics does know unambiguously is that the sum of the world's exports has to equal the sum of the world's imports, and that for every surplus, there must be a deficit. And so, insofar as German policy has taken the form of enabling it to benefit from a large excess of exports over imports, it is almost by definition not 
a universally replicable model uh, for success, despite how frequently uh, it is urged. So yes, there is a role uh, for uh, structural reform. What about monetary policies? There is both a short run and a long run uh, question uh, here. The long run question is, why don't we make the base rate of the base and regular rate of inflation be 3% or 4% or 5%? And then there'll be plenty of room for the real interest rate to be negative 3% or negative 4% or negative 5%. And so if this zero constraint is really an issue, why don't we just raise the normal inflation rate to the point where we're never near the zero bound? And that argument has been made um, by Ken Rogoff repeatedly and by Olivier Blanchard once um, <laughs> uh, because of what went with being uh, sitting official of uh, the IMF. I think it has considerable force as a second best uh, kind of argument. Its two biggest weaknesses are that if you frame the question as what number should be your inflation target, then two's a number, two's an integer, three's an integer, four's an integer, five's an integer, and they're all integers. And you know, it doesn't, doesn't seem like it's a, there's a good reason to have a higher integer, why not have a higher integer rather than a lower integer? The real case for two, though, isn't that two seems like a good integer. It's that two is kind of blurry but near zero, and that you have the idea of price stability, and that you can say we're gonna defend price stability and you can understand that in a somewhat blurry way to run to two, but you can't really define price stability as four. And once four, why not six? And once six, why not eight? I don't know a real way to evaluate uh, that uh, argument. There are relatively few countries that have had stable high single digit inflation. It has a tendency to become higher still. And so this strikes me as a dangerous recommendation. Not that I'm confident that it's worse than what we are living through, but a dangerous recommendation. The second problem is that there is, I think, a real question about the allocative efficiency of very, very low real interest rates. How desirable really is it to spur those investment projects which were not worth doing with a 0% real interest rate, but only become worth doing with a negative 2% uh, real interest rates is that really the right public policy uh, for stimulating investment? I'm not sure. And there is the further concern that very low real interest rates, particularly when also associated with very low nominal interest rates, may encourage all kinds of imprudent uh, risk taking. Similarly, similar kinds of arguments apply to what I think is a pretty fully played out suggestion, um, forward guidance, involves the same kinds of uh, issues. And I have always been struck that forward guidance runs the very real risk that the market will not believe the forward guidance and so no substantial stimulus will be delivered, but the central bank will feel constrained by its own forward guidance, and so when the time comes, will not raise rates in the way that it otherwise would have, and so you will get the worst 
of all worlds. Again, as between do nothing and forward guidance, forward guidance looks okay, but it's really not great. And then there's of course the question of uh, quantit and then there's of course the question of quantitative easing, where there are real issues once interest rates are very low of just how much extra investment will take place at 35 basis points on the Bund that would not have taken place at 60 basis points on the Bund, and how valuable and productive will that investment be, and to what extent will financial stability be undermined, not least because with very, very low interest rates, loans involve essentially no coupon payments, and therefore there is very little monitoring applied to how effective, how effectively borrowed proceeds are uh, being used. So yes, there is a role for monetary policy, but it is not a role that leaves me hugely uh, inspired in addressing secular stagnation, though probably better than uh, the um, better than uh, the alternative. I believe the case is much stronger for structural measures that promote private investment and for expansionary fiscal policies. Expansionary fiscal policies, notice, operate, they shift, push the IS curve to the right to increase equilibrium real interest rates. They are a natural market kind of response to low uh, borrowing uh, costs. As I've said many times, thinking about the American context, if a moment when we can borrow money for 30 years at close to 2% in a currency we print ourselves is not the moment to clean up Kennedy Airport, when will that moment ever come? <laughs> There are a set of uh, further um, uh, rationales for increased infrastructure investment. Can it possibly make sense that at this moment, as I speak to you, the share of public investment in GDP adjusting for depreciation, so that is the net share, is zero? Zero. We are not net investing at all. Nor is uh, Western Europe. Can that possibly make sense given the demand issues, given the productivity of public investment, and given that if we have a moral concern about my children's generation, Deferring maintenance is just as surely passing a burden onto them as issuing debt. And the burden of deferred maintenance compounds at a rate much greater than zero in uh, real uh, in uh, real terms. There are other measures that I describe here to um, uh, to promote uh, spending. I'll just uh, close with what I think is probably the most remarkable IMF document in the 25 years that I have followed the IMF closely. This is not like some Keynesian economic professor. This isn't some guy doing some model arguing for something. This is the IMF, and it's not a research working paper of the IMF. It is the flagship publication of the IMF. And it asks the question for industrialized countries, if they spent 1% of GDP more on infrastructure, what would the consequence be for their debt to GDP ratio? After five years, 
This is their estimate, not my estimate. They say that it would be 6% of GDP lower. Why? Because increased economic growth means increased tax revenues. Increased growth in the short run means increased potential in uh, the long run. So what I would suggest to you is that we need to think about the fact that we are likely headed into a world where the most important, arguably, market price in our economy, the real rate of interest, is going to be substantially lower than most of us have been accustomed to, that that is, on the one hand, telling us something very important about the fundamental forces of savings and investment in our economies. And it is, on the other hand, something that should be a strong impulse to bringing about changes in what we conventionally think of as exogenous variables that will restore stronger economic performance through a more appropriate investment and saving balance. And that this is, I believe, central to understanding the macroeconomic circumstances of the industrialized world going forward. Thank you very much. About, you, you talked about the anemic uh, recovery and the output gap since 2008. Now, if you compare that to, uh, in the global context, to the rise in global debt since 2008, so rather than having any kind of deleveraging, which might have been one factor leading to the output gap, uh, globally we have actually seen an increase in credit to GDP, uh, China being a major part of it. And so looking forward, uh, especially looking at China, that might be unsustainable. So do you think that the output gap, as bad as it is, the future might be worse? It's probably, it's probably uh, my failure. Um, but I have never been able to relate very well to analyses that take household debt plus corporate debt plus government debt, call them total debt, note that they've moved relative to GDP, and say that something terrible has happened. And so I, I have the, the aggregate credit relative to GDP way of thinking is one that I have tended to always have trouble with. And so, and I, so I have more trouble with the word deleveraging than I would if I was a more successful and better student of, uh, of your book. If you're asking, um, and, and, I, and it's why I say things that seem to me to be very much right, but that others find ludicrous and offensive. Um, every speech I gave while I was in the government between 2000 and in 2009 and 2010, included some version of the sentence, it is the central irony of financial crisis that while it is caused by too much confidence, too much borrowing and lending, and too much spending, it is only reversed with more confidence, more borrowing and lending, and more spending. And that, which I very much believe, is the opposite of the 
kind of Austrian Purjo theory, um, which is that you've really got to get rid of all the excesses, and somehow that means letting a lot of debt go bankrupt is somehow central uh, to doing that. That's where you and I have, uh, you and I have tended to uh, be in be in agreement, Atif, on uh, what I thought was your sort of persuasive demonstration that stuff that was much more fundamental than just the sort of financial network failure is behind the crisis. That's where I think you make a very powerful set of points. Where having discovered that debt burdens that inhibit spending are an important contributor to the problem, you then um, are far more enthusiastic about doing a lot of debt writing off and assuming that that will drive things in a positive direction than I would be or than I suspect you would be if you actually came to have responsibility uh, for those uh, <laughs> for, uh, for those uh, for those decisions because often when you write off debt, some of the people to whom you're writing off debt are capital constrained intermediaries who when they lose a dollar become unable to lend 10 and it doesn't take very much of that to make your debt relief program backfire from the point of view of spending. But if you ask where are we sort of going, where are we kind of going forward, I don't think an excess debt crisis in the United States is likely to be our next problem. I don't actually think our, an excess debt crisis in Japan is likely to be its next uh, problem. Uh, I think that a kind of deflationary spiral is more the likely problem in Europe and uh, Japan, and I don't know what, you know, I think I would say that if you think that a human being is healthy, the basic definition of an adult being healthy is a healthy adult is someone who doesn't yet know what they're going to die of. By that standard, I would argue that the current U.S. economic expansion uh, is healthy. I think the... <laughs> I don't, I don't understand, I don't understand China well, but the notion that China has substantially increasing debts of a kind that are unsustainable and that that is going to lead to a discontinuous slowdown at some point strikes me as highly plausible. And... I imagine when it does, it will have significant uh, global consequences. I, some of you may have seen a paper I wrote a few months ago with uh, Lant Pritchett on Asia Foria that basically made the point that uh, human beings naturally extrapolate. And so it tends to be assumed that countries that have grown rapidly in one decade will grow rapidly in the next decade but the data, the data supporting that fact are actually remarkably weak. And so a statistical look at the ensemble of countries would suggest that continued 7% growth in China would really be quite an aberrant event. And so perhaps the question should not be, will something cause China to go wrong, as will China capture catch yet another lucky break. And so I think that that is very much an issue for the global economy going forward. Uh, from the secular to the immediate, there's going to be an interesting meeting tomorrow in Europe. Um, and having, I think appropriately, discussed the, the limits of uh, contagion as an explanation for what's happened after the contagion ended. Do you think that there is serious risk of contagion from a breakdown, a complete breakdown, of Greece's financial relation and political relationship with the rest of the Eurozone? Is this on the record? <laughs> it's a big Chatham house. Um, 
I don't, Chatham House, for those of you who don't know, is a uh, is a kind of British custom for saying that you can repeat what you hear, but you can't attribute it to anybody. But I have been around long enough to know that in rooms of this size, um, one should probably assume that anything one says um, will uh, will be repeated. Bill, I don't think a sensible person would ever say, with respect to a reasonable sized event, that there was no risk of contagion. I just don't see how you can look at what happened after Lehman, look at what happened after uh, Russia failed, look at the relatively minor events that took place in uh, August of 2007 that started all of this, and be serenely confident that there will not be, that there will not be uh, contagion. So I'm not going to tell you that I'm sure there will be a uh, contagion if tomorrow's meeting goes badly. But it seems to me that a prudent person would not want to assume the absence of contagion. Now, I think it is also important, though, to remember that um, an overly committed version of what I just said empowers, to a frightening extent, the potential sources of contagion. And so that's why game theorists invented the concept of mixed strategy. And that's why it has always seemed to me that those who think everybody, everything should be completely transparent um, don't understand so well how the world works. I mean, the example I like to give in analogy to bailout policy is what should countries' approach to ransom policy be? So only a fool would say that, well, that's an important policy question and it needs to be debated by the legislature and guidance needs to be, guidelines need to be produced and everybody needs to understand what your ransom policy is. Well, that would be, you know, a manual for kidnappers. So that would almost certainly be a bad idea. Well, you know, not even the Israelis come close to having a policy of no ransom ever. And so, in fact, the policy that countries kind of have with respect to ransom is sort of like the policy Professor Summers has with respect to makeup exams. A fair amount of assertion about how there aren't going to be makeup exams without a very compelling reason, and then a certain amount of pragmatism when the time comes while saying that it's not precedent setting and hoping that it's not seen as precedent setting, and you sort of muddle forward. And you, and. I've sort of learned over, and what I guess I've learned over the last 30 years is that my approach to makeup exams is not actually unprincipled and wrong. It's actually sensible and prudent, even if it is mushy and difficult to characterize in traditionally rigorous terms. And I guess that's what has to go on with respect to thinking about uh, bailout policy. Hi. <clears throat> we uh, spoke about the cycles of investment and how that relates to cycles and in interest rates. And <clears throat> you're mentioning some of the exogenous variables that would be important in, in, in motivating these changes. Um, my hypothesis is that one of these important exogenous variables is the rate of technological progress. Um, and that would also, as one might expect, uh, coincide with increased levels of productivity. But as you mentioned, if, you know, if productivity is only output divided by the number of laborers and the actual output is not supply constrained but demand constrained, the rate of technological progress might actually cause substitution effects that result in a reduced demand for actual output. Uh, so, like one example would, with Apple would be that an iPod is is better today than it was yesterday, even though it has the same price, which would result in actual uh, a mismeasurement, if you will, of inflation. Um, and and to that point, do you think that uh, the target for inflation should somewhat rely on what the rate of technological progress is? 
There were a lot of as- there were a lot of aspects of that question. Let me uh, and you should catch up with Bill Janeway afterwards because he knows more about technical change uh, than I'll ever know. Let me just uh, comment on two. Let me just make two comments in response to it, and they're only in partial response to it. One is I have had the idea, and I. I'm reasonably confident it's a relatively plausible and interesting academic idea. I haven't decided whether I think it's a good policy idea or not yet. That kind of for the reasons you say, the underlying inflation rate should probably be should probably be greater if the underlying rate of technological change is slower because you need to have room to have a lower real interest rate. And that if you set a nominal GDP target it has that property, that the uh, implicit inflation rate in a nominal GDP target is higher if the real GDP growth rate is lower. And so it has struck me that an argument for nominal GDP targeting is that it builds in exactly the kind of adjustment that you describe in a kind of natural, uh, in a kind of natural way. Whether that's a clever academic observation or a reason why the world's inflation targeting central banks should take seriously the idea of shifting to nominal GDP targeting is a question on which I haven't made up my mind and I wouldn't be prepared to make a recommendation to central banks uh, to change what they're doing without a higher degree of conviction than I now have, but I think you do point to uh, an interesting argument. I'll just remark, since you raised the question of sort of technological change and supply constraints and demand constraints, it wasn't my topic today. But I would say, if you ask me what I don't feel like I understand very well about the economy and wish I did, that seems very important, I would say probably at the top of the list would be the following question. There seems to be overwhelming evidence that technology is on a very substantial scale displacing labor and influencing labor. Maybe it's leading to the replacement of a large number of workers whose jobs can be done cheaper by computers. Maybe it's reinforcing a large number of other workers who can be far more productive than they were before. But it seems like it is hugely salient for huge changes in rewards and huge changes in the level of employment in a way that was not the case before. For that to be true, you would think there would be extraordinary increases in productivity. After all, if all the people in retailing are being replaced by machines, then if you compute output per person, it should have gone way up. And so how is one to square the apparently pervasive impact of technology on the distribution of factor rewards with the general evidence of a substantial productivity slowdown? And how is one to reconcile those two things in a large way for the American economy and for other industrial economies? I don't have a good answer to that question, and I've asked the question a fair number of times without hearing a compelling answer. But I think in terms of understanding how the world works um, and understanding what we're all trying to deal with, that is a hugely important question. Woody. Larry, uh, you started off saying the standard paradigm is not adequate to describe this, and I think what you've done is terrific, especially the part about public investment. But I'm bothered by something. I worked on that large McKinsey Global Institute study with Bob Gordon on the sources of stagnation in Japan and Europe and eurosclerosis. The conclusion was that product and labor market deregulation would be 10 times more important than any macroeconomic policy. The head of the Italian Central Bank a year ago said to us at dinner that even with minus 10 interest rates, people would not invest if they couldn't fire a worker. It's that important to people. 
And you, Germany attributes, many people have said, a lot of its success to the Hartz reforms and the other reforms in the labor markets. You, in your work, call it structural reforms, and you say they've been tried and didn't work. But isn't it fair to say that because of political reasons, we never really have done what we ought to have done, which, to rat which is to radically increase flexibility in product and labor markets? I think few people would say that's been tried, except in maybe Scandinavia. It's a very fair, it's, it's a very fair question, Woody. And I guess I'd respond in a, f respond, uh, in a few different ways. Uh, first, just how much of the German success is winning a zero-sum game is, I think, quite open to question. And if you evaluate how much of uh, the German uh, growth is related to the increased competitiveness and the emergence of a substantial trade surplus, I think you'll find that it's a lot. Second, um, let me assume that you didn't, assume that I wasn't asking the question for a reason. Let me get a show of hands. Um, take, the, take the following statistic. What fraction of the men are not working between the ages of 25 and 54? How many people think that number is higher in France than in the United States? France being quintessentially sclerotic. How many people think it's higher in France? How many people think it's higher in the United States? Well, you've been well informed. I guess Paul Krugman's been highlighting this point for uh, for some substantial time for some substantial time period. This idea that nobody will do anything because nobody will hire anybody because they can't be fired and so forth. You would think that it would lead to the sclerotic places having lower levels of employment than uh, the less. Uh, than uh, the substantially less sclerotic places. If you asked yourself what would be the effect of, if the only thing that were going on were those things, would, and those things were getting worse in their impact, would you tend to expect inflation or deflation? Well, you can't hire anybody, you can't fire anybody. They tend to be inflationary, not to be deflationary. So I, I may well be, and I'm, I'm quite open to the view that uh, if I had spent more time closer to the ground or I'd ever tried to do business in uh, Italy, that I would be more resonant than my slight making fun of the word structural uh, caused me to be with respect to those problems. But I, so I don't want to say that those aren't problems. I do want to say that I've gone back and done a fair amount of reading of the macroeconomics of the late 1930s. And there was a lot of stuff said about structural problems that looked awfully stupid a few years later when no laws got, ch when uh, no laws uh, got uh, changed. And um, somehow the structural problems had uh, melted away. And so I am much more impressed than McKinsey is by aggregate demand as an elixir with respect to structural problems. And just as I conceded that I would probably be more sympathetic to the structural diagnosis um, if I'd spent more time trying to do business in Italy, I think that the people who write those kinds of reports who are usually businesses and the kinds of people who work with businesses who frankly are usually blissfully ignorant of macroeconomics and for whom the concept of aggregate demand is basically alien, I think they 
tend to gravitate to what is close to them and the set of issues that Keynes emphasized having to do with uh, the fallacy of composition um, tends not to be the way they think at all. So I, I don't, in general, I think that we probably in economic policy debates have too much either or and not enough uh, both and. And I'd be happy to support and support with more energy, energy um, a range of, you know, I think if, roughly speaking, if uh, Germany got its way in most structural debates in Europe and Keynes got his way yep. in most macroeconomic debates in Europe, it would probably be a good, it would probably be a good thing. And so I don't want to be heard as some kind of um, apostle of rent, of rent seeking statism um, here, even as others should not want to be heard as not recognizing the role of macroeconomics and demand in a basically deflationary environment. Thank you. Thank you all for the chance to be with you.